Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. Uh, and so I hope that this will link in with last week, what you heard last week. I hope that it will have some connection uh, for you. And if you weren't here last Sunday, well, you're going to get a fresh take. And so it should be good for all of us. So the title of today's message is uh, The Open Heart. The Open Heart, out of the book of Luke. You know, in the past seven years that I've been your pastor, uh, I've spoken on the heart six times, six times in the last seven years. How many times has Pastor Tom spoke on the heart in the last seven years? Yeah, that's because you all counted and paid attention, right? No, it's because I just told you. <laughs> Seven, six times in various ways. This manner will be different than those other times. And I want to take a minute to look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, sometimes we can look at women of the Bible, even Christian women of today, and see how powerful they are and how much impact they can make in our lives. And we want to glean from her today. What we're going to be reading is how when she first received word from an angel that she was going to give birth uh, to the Savior of the universe. You can imagine the awe-inspiring moment uh, that must have been. So turn with me in your Bibles into the Luke chapter 1. We're going to read 26 through 38. We'll put it up on the screen for you. But I kind of want to read through it slow to try to get it in before we try to comment on it, okay? It says in verse 26, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God. So God sent an angel named Gabriel to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. We learned on our Wednesday services about betrothal. It's kind of like engagement, but different. But for today's sake, let's just say uh, uh, that uh, she was engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Verse 29 says, But when he saw him, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary, verse 34 said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Good question. An angel, and the angel answered her, answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. I usually, at this point, look over at Gracie and say, we could still have another one. And at which point, she would look at me with disgust and say, no. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God... Nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me 
according to your word. For those of you that were here last week, doesn't that sound familiar? And the angel departed from her. I'd like you to pray with me today. Lord God, we desperately need you this morning. God, we are people who want to serve you and we have issues and problems and circumstances that we worry about, but we also know we have a destiny and a potential that sometimes we neglect. And God, we need help to stay on track. We pray today that you would bless your people in whichever way they need to be blessed. God, you know what's going on in our lives, and we ask that you would help us with those things. Lord, for those that do not know you and have just come to church to come to church, I pray that they would open their heart and walk out of this place born again. I pray that they would leave walking as a son or a daughter of God now, and that they would see a transformation that only Jesus can bring in their life. I pray for those that have been saved a long time, God. I pray that their hearts would be open and not hard. I pray, God, for blessing and favor upon our service today. Thanking you, God, as I decrease, you increase. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Start first talking about the heart of Mary, the heart of Mary. This young woman, we call her young woman, but we would probably call her a girl because she was not very old at all. Some say she was a teenager. I don't know. I read these conflicting things. I'm not sure. But I'll tell you one thing. She wasn't older. She was very much younger. And here she is uh, where the Bible calls her troubled. Another translation says she was greatly troubled as she's having this interaction with the angel. Another translation says she was confused or slightly confused. So we put all of this together combined with the fact that the angel says, don't be afraid. So obviously he saw fear in her. So we see that she was troubled, greatly troubled, confused, fearful, uh, 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 misunderstanding, bewildered is a good English word to describe where she was at. Now, I want you to think about that just for a minute. An angel speaking to her, so of course she's going to feel like that. You would feel like that. If an angel just came up to you and says, uh, you know, here I am, the angel Gabriel, which, by the way, Gabriel wasn't just an any old angel. He was an archangel, so he was probably magnificent looking and powerful. If it was in human size, we'd probably think he was very, very large. We don't know that for a fact, but highly likely. Point being is that you can imagine if this angelic being comes and talks to you, you would feel all those things. However, however, her feeling this way, confused, troubled, uh, fearful, was not just over that. It was the things that the angel said. And this is what kind of enlightened me when he said, oh, favored one. She was troubled at that. She was confused by that. You know, sometimes... When God speaks to us, either through preaching, his word, through prayer, and God tells us something like, you're worthy, you're valuable, you're awesome, you're powerful, I have a plan for you, sometimes we get bewildered. We say, me? I don't know about you. (laughs) There's times when I can be kind of proud, I guess, and there's times when I can be super confident, but a lot of times I just think I'm an average guy. The idea that God would say, you're something, you're favored, I've got a plan for you, Mm. tenses me up, makes me feel like I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And then right after he says, oh, favored one, he says, the Lord is with you. Now, if I tell you the Lord is with you, 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 50-50 chance you can embrace that. But if an angel, an angelic being tells you, the Lord is with you, you're going to know the Lord is with you, right? And here she is feeling this way, favored. The Lord is with me. No wonder she was confused. But I want to tell you today, brothers and sisters, we know through the word of God, through the Bible, that we are favored of him. We know from the Bible, from the word of God, that we, the Lord is with us. 
the one that Mary is giving birth to is going to be called Emmanuel. The Lord is with us. Anybody who has Jesus has this. And yet sometimes we wonder, is he with me? Is he here? Am I favored? So this idea that Mary was troubled or confused, perplexed, bewildered, fearful can happen to us. We get bewildered sometimes at other things of God. Because how many know the things of God just seem out of our area of expertise, you know? Your, your, your job that you have, you know, you, you work on computers or you, you fix cars or you, you, you paint houses, whatever it is that you do, you know about those things. You're going to go to work tomorrow and you're going to do your job because you know your job. If I was to ask you about your job, you'd tell me about your job and you'd be able to uh, uh, let me know. But when I start to talk to you about the things of God, you might be going, oh, preacher, that's for you. I don't know about these things too much. So when God approaches us, like in a service, like last Sunday, and speaks to our hearts, when we're studying the word and things happen and we begin to realize things, sometimes they feel like they're out of our wheelhouse. This is not what we're good at. It requires a different approach, and specifically for Mary, she's receiving an assignment from God. That just it makes it even more perplexing and hard to understand. I want to tell you that her assignment was unique. How many know? It's highly unlikely. Not highly. It's absolutely not going to happen that any lady in here is going to have an angel come to you and say, hey, guess what, highly favored one? You're going to have a, a, a Jesus going to be birthed in you. It's not going to happen to you. But I want to tell you, assignments happen to us all the time. God gives you an assignment, me an assignment. He gives Aspire Church an assignment. And he not only gives us a big assignment, he gives us daily assignments. <laughs> Sometimes he, he, he brings you in a situation. I was in a situation just recently. I was very perplexed. I didn't know what to do. I said, God, I think you might want me to speak. I think you might want me to say something in this circumstance and situation. But you're going to have to make this happen because you know all the things that are going on in here. You see what's happening in this room. And you know what? Within 15 minutes, the atmosphere changed. Uh, and I had opportunity to witness about Jesus. It wasn't because I was great. It's because God assigns us. He assigns you things like that. Your assignment is more than just raising your kids, which is a pretty powerful assignment. It's more than just providing for your family, which is a great assignment and requires a lot of effort. But there's assignments, assignments, assignments that he gives to you and I. This causes us to be perplexed. All of these things, I'm going somewhere with all of this. She's so perplexed that when the angel finishes, she asks some questions for him. Common, isn't it? You know, how many know that sometimes when people give us assignments, we don't pick it up. Your boss tells you, I want you to do this, this, and that, and it's not something you've done before. You might say, hey, hold up, I, I've, I've got a few questions Well, same thing with God. God gives us some perplexing assignments. We're not exactly sure what to do. You might be saying, wait, 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 I've got some questions, which is okay. But I want to tell you, with all of this, she's confused. She doesn't feel up to the task. She doesn't feel like she's worthy of this. She's receiving this very unique assignment from God. She has questions about it, and yet, She remained open for the entire time. This is the key, brothers and sisters, when we're feeling good, when we've got the excitement, the joy of the Lord. It's a revival meeting. Uh, People are in the church. Man, there's new people. It's uh, uh, exciting. We have different things going on. Uh, It's easy to say, man, my heart is open. But the key is being open when you're feeling like Mary. The key is being open when you're not sure what's going on. The key is keeping your heart open open when life seems to be crushing you a bit following track with me track with me here so with that being said I've described Mary for you now what I would like to do is give you one description actually a couple in one but there's a lot more we could talk about this but a description of an open heart 
of an open heart. What does it look like? What do I mean when I say, open your heart? Open your heart, because that could mean different things to different people. I heard a valid description of an open heart years ago. It stuck with me. I I still uh, stick with it today when I feel like I'm getting a little bit hardened towards the things of God or a little bit not just going through the motions. Anybody ever feel like that? You know, sometimes we do. I start uh, 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 referring back to what I heard a long time ago. And this description was having an open heart means saying, Lord, do to me whatever you want. Do to me whatever you want. If there's something that needs changing, change it. If there's something that I need to change, speak it to me and give me the power to change it. If there's something you want me to do, which is very, very, do not do that. You might move to England. Uh, But you say, (laughs) get it, get it. I moved to England. Do Lord, what do you want me to do? Those are questions we ask. We ask of the Lord. For Mary, she responds, let it be to me according to your word. I wonder how many of us pray like that. That's what an open heart is. Oh, I'm going through all kinds of hardships and trials. I'm not sure I can't handle any more assignments. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with what I got. But then you say, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. You speak, I do. You reveal, I respond. This needs to be what an open heart is. There was a scripture, a passage of scripture that Pastor Manuel spoke last week out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 that really, really spoke to me. It says, for this reason... We also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So here we see another aspect of an open heart. These guys are preaching, they're teaching, they're sitting them down, they're discipling them, they're giving them spiritual advice on what to do. But those people did not take it as just the word of man. They took it as, wow, this is God speaking through them. And I want to tell you, this is a very, very big indicator of whether or not our heart is open or not. What seemed at first to these guys as a human, natural interaction was actually divine. I wonder, and and, and the reason I say that is because it takes an open heart to understand that, to recognize this is more than just this guy or this girl speaking here. This is coming from God. This is coming from God. Do you know the difference between the natural, the human, and the divine. Do you realize that sometimes what you might perceive as human or natural is actually God speaking to you? God speaking to you. There's been so many times in my life that someone has said something to me off the cuff that it was like the Holy Spirit just rained down from heaven and put it in my heart. Equally, there's been so many times when I wasn't really, really listening to men or women or whoever, and I missed what God was saying to me. Are you following? I'm trying to help you to how to have an open heart. You're going to have to be able to know the difference between the human and the natural and the divine and the godly. And you can if your heart is open. You should wake up. You can start today if you want. But wake up tomorrow and say, God... What assignment do you have for me? What are you going to speak to me today? And if you're waiting for trumpets and, you know, the angelic host to say things, no, I want you to listen for that still small voice. You read, you pray, God speaks through that. But then as you go throughout the day, he'll tell you, hey, that girl's lonely. She needs a friend. Hey, your boss, the one you want to give him a what for right now, give him a smile instead. Those are words from God. Do you recognize that? That's what open hearts do. Open hearts do. Let me 
give you another description from the Apostle Paul about an open heart because that's our goal today is to leave this place with a heart that's open or more open, if you came in with an open heart, more open than when you arrived. So Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. You remember that Paul, before his name was Paul, it was Saul. You remember? He was a religious guy, very well-educated religious guy, but he was a devil and a half, man. How many know you can have a lot of smarts up here and still not be right with God? That was him. And so in verse number one, it says, But Saul, Acts 9-1, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Wow. Went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, the, the Christians, the disciples, they were also known as the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Before we read, I just want to continue reading. Does, do you get where this guy's at? He's like, he's, he's on one, as we say in California. He, he's bent, man. He's, he's ready to do something. He's, he's like, give me, I want some legal authority to gather up these Christians and take them to Jerusalem bound. Man, he, he, he's, this is not playing. He's serious. So he's not in a spiritual state of mind at all. He's in a demonic state of mind. He's infused by many demons, if it were. But in verse 3, something begins to change. Something happens to him. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? You know, when your heart begins to open, you want to know more of who God is. You want to know what's going on. You don't want to just come to church to hear preaching to get through your hour and a half of service. You want to come to church to give you a little start and a motivation so that when you go home, you can live it out so that when you're a man or woman in your marriage, you can be a godly man or woman. When you're a person on your job, you want to be that kind of person. You want to be a real Christian, not just a religious person. The world does not need any more religious people. It needs real Christians with an open heart that says, Who are you, Lord? It's a good prayer. It's a good prayer. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. That's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't pussyfoot around. He doesn't, you know, go walk on eggshells. I'm Jesus and you're persecuting me. Here's the problem. This has to change. His heart is open. So he says, but rise, verse 6, and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. When your heart's open, you can be told what to do. It's not what do you want to do, or what do you prefer, or what do you require none of that. It's, hey, I've got things for you to do, and I want you to do them. It it might not be what you enjoy the most. It might be, but it might not be. It might be something that you've been avoiding for quite some time, because it's a very painful thing to go there. It's something that just doesn't really set well with you. It's not really who you are. It's not really the way you were raised. Uh, It it really doesn't fit in your community. Uh, It's all of these things, but God says, look it, your heart's open now. You're pliable. I can work with you, and I've got some things for you to accomplish. Some of you that have been Christians for a long time and have cut your teeth on this kind of preaching and have already said to yourself many times over, Lord, what do you want me to do? Can I tell you that that has not 
finished for you yet. There's still another day for you. It might not be a day of glory like when you were young, but there's another day of where God has something for you to do. There's more for you to accomplish in this season of your life. But it will only be accomplished if you have an open heart, an open heart. Rise and enter the city and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. That's verse number seven. Verse number eight says, Saul rose from the ground. How many know that where God touched you is not where you're going to stay? You know, sometimes we like beautiful touches from God. Some of you were touched beautifully last Sunday, and we just want to stay in that moment. We want to stay in that thing, but you can't stay there. God was speaking to him and working with Saul when he was on the ground, but he couldn't stay on the ground. He couldn't stay in that place where things for him to go. There was avenues for him to uh, uh, walk down. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing, spiritual significance there. Sometimes you become a Christian. Sometimes God speaks to you. Your eyes are open, but you still don't see I know this was real, but what? I know you have a plan, but I'm not sure what's next. I don't, I don't see. I know that, but although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. And I want you to catch this next phrase, which is easy to look over here. He says, so they led him by the hand and brought him in to Damascus. Just minutes earlier. I got papers. Get all these Christians. Round them up. I'm in charge here. I'm, I, I, I'm a religious zealot. I have all of this understanding. Uh, uh, you listen to me. You obey me. You do what I say. He's breathing murderous threats. Now he can't see and he needs someone to lead him by the hand. Something happens when you open your heart to the Holy Spirit. No longer are you running your life. No longer are you in charge. No longer is it about your dreams and your plans and what you want to do in your life. Even though that has a a place, it's not primarily about that. Your life becomes more about what he wants. It becomes about how he wants you to conduct yourself on the job. uh, uh, It's about him and his plan for you and your career. God doesn't want you to not have a career. Of course he wants you to have a career. It's just not your career. It's his career that he lets you get to be part of. Get it? It's important. It's all of these things begin to happen. Let him by the hand. Now, instead of walking with confidence, he has to walk by faith. He has to trust those ones that he was going to murder. He's got to trust the ones who were his enemy. He's got to say, okay, you're in charge now. Of course, he's saying God's in charge, but they were the one who had him by the hand. You know, when I was a young man, I heard the gospel. Young man, I was a teenager, heard the gospel. Didn't want to be a Christian, though, because being a Christian was uncool. Only weird kids were Christians, Cool kids like me were hanging out with the fellas, doing all kinds of things that gave us notoriety in the streets. I want to tell you something. You become a Christian, you're going to have to give up some of that notoriety and begin to walk softly with God, sometimes with someone taking you by the hand. Paul's heart was now open for something that I want to just touch briefly on It's open for service. Everybody say service. That's important. It seems to be for some to be a misunderstood topic. They seem to miss, uh, they lack the comprehension of what Christian servanthood is like. Servanthood is not something that's beneath you. It doesn't mean that you're a lowly servant It doesn't mean that you couldn't make it here, so you had to be here. It doesn't mean that at all. Nor is it necessarily 
some sort of position as a servant. How can I be a servant in the house of God? There are servants in the house of God. There are jobs of servanthood in the kingdom of God that have different names in servanthood. But it's not necessarily that which I'm talking about today. What I'm speaking about today is this attitude of life, which is a servanthood. An attitude of life that says, Whatever else I am, whatever else I do, I serve. I serve. I've got a little mini story here that might sound boastful. I, I might sound boastful. If you take it that way, shame on you. I don't mean to sound boastful. And I apologize if it does sound like that, but nevertheless, please don't take it like that. I was a supervisor with the city of Southgate, California, the water department. That was my job. And I had just been promoted to a uh, job of water superintendent, which was the top job of the water department at that time. None of those jobs I wanted. I wanted to be a pastor. (laughs) And actually, I was pastoring a church at the same time. But the more I pastored, the more I kept getting promoted uh, and it doesn't work like that for everyone, but a lot of us in here know what that's like. You know, you're serving God, and they just keep giving you raises and promotions. Uh, some of you are saying, well, how do I get that? Well, you might try serving. Uh, it might, might work. <laughs> it, did, it did for me and others. So here I am. I'm at the top. A guy who was under me, one of the supervisors, he's retiring, and so he didn't want to have a retirement party at a restaurant like normal people do. He wants to have it on the grounds. I'm a, I'm a worker. I want all the workers to be able to come to my retirement party. So we threw him a retirement party in one of the, one of the halls of the uh, city-owned buildings there. And we catered in food, and we had him there and uh, ha- had everybody come in. Uh, but they had no organization, so I remember I brought my church clothes, <laughs> and I wore my church clothes because I had church clothes back in those days. We dressed up and looked nice and all that. I wore my church clothes, and I was the usher for his uh, uh, um, retirement party, and people were like, well, go, go sit down. Aren't you supposed to? I said, well, no, because no one else is here. I'm going to stand right here. People were commenting how shiny my shoes were and how nice I looked and all that. It's not the reason that I stayed there. I stayed there because I, serving is in me. It is who I am. It, 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 you, know, you know, and the sad thing is some people are content to let me serve and not serve themselves, which is fine. But I want to tell you what I'm talking about today. When you have an open heart, service gets in you. It gets in you. It becomes what you do and who you are. Even if you're the prime minister of the United Kingdom, it's who you are. And that's what Paul did. He was a head honcho, university trained, a a member of the Sanhedrin, top dog, touched by God. But yet he started to serve because his heart was open. Luke chapter 10 and verse 2 says, these were his instructions to them. This is Jesus speaking. The harvest is great. The harvest is the harvest of souls for sure, okay? For sure, there's a lot of people that need Jesus. Can you say amen? But we can also just call this harvest the working field of God. The working field of God. So the working field of God is great, big, large, consuming, possibly feeling overwhelming to you. But the workers are few. Few people have their hearts open enough to the point where they want to serve, where they want to serve, serve somebody, go and visit somebody, Invite somebody, call somebody and say, how can I pray for you? Find something in the church. Work with kids, work with youth, clean the church. You know, I'm just throwing things out there. I'm not trying to advocate for those things because, again, we're talking about an attitude that's in here. Because if your heart is closed, all of that will just seem like a hassle. It'll just be a hassle, man. Why? Why? 
oh, I don't want to do that. I just want to get out, man. I just want to go home. Oh, if I, man, my friends are going to meet me at the... That's what the attitude will be. But when your heart's open, it's like, God, I'm in debt to you. I remember what it was like without Jesus, and I never want to go back. I know what it's like and where I'm headed if I stop serving. I'm spending way too much time on service. My point is having an open heart here. Having an open heart, open heart. When your heart is open, you're like Mary. When heart is open, you're like Saul, who became the apostle Paul. But there's a reward that comes your way as well. And we're going to finish up with this reward of an open heart. Luke chapter 1, verse 46. We're back to Mary here. Mary had her perplexed time, her questioning time. Finally, she accepts it. And in verse 46, it's 46, it says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. Do you see the difference? Do you see the attitude is no longer like, well, How is this going to happen? And I, I'm, I'm favored? Are you sure? Uh, all these things, I'm not... No, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For See, no longer is she worried about the Lord being with her. No longer is it bothering her that she's called a highly favored one. Now she's saying she received it. Her heart was open. She received what God had. And now she says, I am blessed and everyone's going to call me blessed. It wasn't pride and arrogance. It was an acceptance of God's reality. It says, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. When your heart's open and you receive from God, you start to testify. You start to talk about it. You start to tell people about things that God has done for me in his holy name, he says. So we see that she's rejoicing. I know that there's a lot of closed-off Christians, a lot of closed-hearted Christians, a lot of hard-hearted Christians because of the small amount of rejoicing that I see in the world today. As Christians, we should be rejoicing when our hearts are open before God. We talk a lot about it, but we don't always do, as, do it as much as we should. Can you say amen? You know, at a recent Wednesday night study here, we started studying about the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can ask the people that come. They can tell you what the marriage supper of the Lamb is. We taught them that. They know. They can tell you what the requirements are, what it's all about. But one of the things that we learned was in Revelation 19.7 that uh, the voice of the great multitude in heaven said this about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us rejoice and exult. Not exult. But exult. That's next level rejoicing. Some of you know how to rejoice. You know how to sing, get your praise on, worship God, do some dancing in church, uh, get excited for the Lord. You know how to feel that rejoicing. But do you know how to exult? That's next level rejoicing. Uh, and back in old English times, that word exult meant to leap for joy. I'd leap for joy, but I might hurt myself. So, uh, Leap for joy. That's exulting. That's what happens when your heart is open. That's the reward of an open heart. If you've been down because of this circumstance and that circumstance, hey, for Mary, it was going to get worse before it got better. Her husband was going to be condemned as a fornicator. She was going to get all those sideway looks. You're pregnant. How would you get? I thought you were betrothed. The Lord got me pregnant. Oh, uh uh-huh, sure, yeah. She had to go through all that. That didn't stop her exaltation. Not exaltation, exaltation. She continued on. (laughs) Do you rejoice? If you don't, open your heart. Open your heart to what God is saying. Open-hearted people also receive another type of reward. They stand when when they're in the middle of the mud. Do you know that I'm not talking about literal mud? I'm not talking about standing in mud. I'm not talking. I'm saying when you're in your life, feels like you're stuck in the mud and you've got to just stand. That's all you can do. You get to rejoice. You rejoice in that. You get to stand. 
Look what 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10 says. In fact, we expected to die. Some of us felt like that from time to time. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger. And this is the part that I want you to see. And he will rescue us again. Yeah, he got us out of that pickle. Boy, we got through that hard time. But now my faith is built because my heart is open that he's going to do it again. Hard times are going to come. I've been through a lot of things. I'm going to go through a lot of things. But when your heart's open, you exult. You rejoice. He will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him. And he will continue to rescue us. Why? Because their hearts were open. That's the reward. One last thing. Open-hearted believers understand the present when others don't. And they see the future when others don't. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. I don't have time to go into it, but if we begin to put a list up on the screen here of his present troubles, they would be anything but small to us. We would call them huge, gargantuan, unbelievable, overwhelming, oppressive, huge weight to bear and carry. He called them small. He had a different perspective. It's what happens when your heart's open. So they won't last very long. How different from us. We go through a small trial. We're having a, 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 a day or two of marital difficulty. If it goes bad, maybe a week or a month, we're, like, we're bound for the divorce court. Nah, it won't last long. It won't last long. You guys are going to learn to get through it. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Do you see? They understood the present. They saw the future. They understood where it was going. It's what happens when your heart's open. When your heart's open. Verse 18, so we do not look at the troubles we can now see, that we can see now. That's good and smart things. See, I can tell you, hey, quit looking at your troubles. Quit, quit looking at these problems. There's more to life than that. And you go, yeah, pastor, but pastor, but you know, pastor, pastor, you, that's, you can do that. But see, I can tell you all day long, but unless you have an open heart, you'll never see what God sees. So we do, don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. That's almost... Uh, uh, what is it paradoxical is the word saying how can you fix your gaze on something you can't see when your heart's open you can see it when your heart's open you'll fix your gaze on that which is unseen you'll focus on the spiritual for the things we see now will soon be gone but the things we cannot see will last forever it's what happens when your heart's open Start talking like that. Start acting like that. That becomes not a verse. That becomes you. That becomes your narrative. See, this is what happens when your heart's open. I want to tell you, I was so pleased for many of you last Sunday, and all of us got some sort of touch from God. But I want to tell you today, without an open heart, it will just be a thing that happened. But with an open heart, and we can see God. Do such wonderful things. Let's open our hearts. You know, I'm going to stop talking, but the, one of the leading killers in Western society, uh, particularly in the UK and the US, is arteriosclerosis, which is the hardening of the arteries of the heart. Uh, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. It's a common thing. It happened the older you get, the more susceptible you are to this. And I've got to tell you, there's so many people with spiritual hardening of their arteries they've hardened themselves off to the things of God and the thing is with your physical heart it's what you digest it's what you eat it's it's your choice same thing even more so in the kingdom of God you want to have a hard heart go for it you want to be closed off and die at a young age spiritually that's up to you 
The good news is if you want to soften your heart, you can do that today. If you want to open your heart, you don't have to wait for a feeling. You make a choice. It's faith, a decision. Thanks for listening today. Give Jesus a big hand clap of praise. How about we lift our voice? Lift our voice and give him praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Let's all stand to our feet. Would you stand with me today? Thank you for being such an attentive congregation. Gracie and I are uh, madly in love with this church. We're so blessed to be able to be part of this congregation. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you have done such a wonderful thing. We thank you that we felt something begin and break last week, and throughout the week we've been praying and seeking you and believing and trusting that you can do great and awesome things. Lord, we know that there are many that have closed their hearts, Lord God, but we have the ability today to open our hearts to you, and we pray your Holy Spirit would just wide open, wide open for us. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Is there anybody here before we move on that has not accepted Christ and needs to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior? If someone said, are you born again? You'd say, I'm not sure. Then you need to accept Christ. If you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just lift your hand all across this place if you've never done so before so we can pray with you. Hallelujah. Then let me change the order of this service very quickly. My brothers and my sisters, I know what it's like to close my heart off to God. So when I preach this to you, I'm not talking out of some super confident mode of where, you know, hey, you're, you, you do this. I don't know. I know exactly what it's like. Uh, the good news is I also know what it's like to say, nope, I'm not closing off. I'm not closing. I'm not closing. I'm staying open. I also know what it's like to reap the reward of an open heart. And that's why I can preach to you this way, because you can have it. You can have it today. And if that's you, you need that. You want to open your heart, or you want your heart to remain open. You want to fight for an open heart. Why don't you come on up to this altar today, and let me pray with you. i got some people in the back are coming. Was there anybody else you'd like to come today? You want prayer today, prayer today. Open your heart, open your heart, open your heart. Anybody else come today? Maybe your heart's already open, but you need to fight to keep an open heart. That's a good thing, too. You need that as well. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is a good God. Can we all say amen? He's an awesome God. Today, if your heart is open, I need you to stretch forth your hands. And pray for these that are here. If you're here at the altar, and whatever reason you're here, lift your hands high to the Lord. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you today in the name of Jesus, God. So grateful for your goodness, uh, for your awesomeness. We thank you for what you did in Mary. We thank you for the example of her attitude. Help us today, Lord God, to keep our hearts open before you, Lord God. To keep them open open to the things that you're saying and speaking to us. God, let us be people of service, Lord God. Bless us, help us, encourage us today, Lord God. Praying in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Binding every work of darkness, Lord, your keeping power is more than sufficient here today, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Have your way, my God. Have your way. Oh, thank you, Lord. Come on, church, pray with me today. Father, we're just asking, God, that you would bless and help and encourage. Open heart, open heart before you, Lord God. Open to the things that you're doing, uh, the things that you're saying, Lord God. Receiving from you, Lord God. Uh, Blessing and helping our sister today. In Jesus' name, uh, Lord, an open heart to you and the things that you're doing. Father, we're careful to praise you, God. Heavenly Father, we do come before you praising you and worshiping you. We thank you, God, that we get to experience this fullness and this goodness of you today, Lord God. You have rescued us in the past. You will rescue us again. That's our confidence in you, Lord. 
Our hearts are wide open to you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Give him a big hand clap of praise. Praise God. Thank you for coming today. I pray that you glean something from this, uh, 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 something. God is a good God. He can even use a guy like me to speak something into your life. And so we pray that you've been encouraged. Read the passage again, uh, Luke 1, 26 through 38, and see if there's something there for you. Acts 9. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk. We meet in different locations throughout the week, and if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk. Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services and once again if you'd like to view online you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.